All right, good morning, you guys. It's good to see everybody. Now, my eyes might be playing tricks on me, but do I see Craig Arnhardt in here? <laughs> Yay, Craig, welcome, brother. It's good to see you. <laughs> I was like, oh, I gotta make sure I'm on point now, you guys. <laughs> good to see you, Craig, God bless you. Uh, we, have some, uh, we have also our brother from Golden Springs. He's here, God bless you. And then I also, I wanted to point out, oh, we have a new brother, Daniel, where's Daniel? Daniel, Daniel's new, so why don't we give Daniel a welcome? And then I think I see Kenton somewhere. There he is from Arizona, right? It's good to see you, Kenton. God bless you. God, the thunderous applause, you guys. I can tell you guys are happy to have new, new guests with us. <laughs> so, uh, God bless you guys. Just a quick uh, prayer request. Our brother Joey uh, requested, Joey, what was the name? Tina? No, Tina, who looks like going to pass away from cancer. It's about to. It's about to. And it's your sister's sister. It's my wife's Your wife's sister. Why don't we lift her up in prayer, you guys, really quick. And then, uh, and then we have Rodney here with us. God bless you, Rodney. He went, went this way, so it looks good. I like that. Uh, but let's open in prayer, you guys. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we're able to come together and gather before you, Lord. I want to welcome those guys who are joining us online, the guys that are here this morning who got up early, Lord, to come hear your word and to fellowship and have breakfast. And Lord, this morning we lift up Tina before you, Lord, who is about to go home. And, and Lord, we pray that she does have a relationship with you, that she's able to go home to you. I lift up Denise, her sister, before you, and Joey, Lord, that, you would, that they would be able to minister to the family. And Lord, are there many requests that are probably here this morning? I think of Andrew, Corona, Lord, who's going through a time where, uh, where there may be that spot on his lung. Lord, I lift him up before you and the family. And Lord, many of the requests that are here that are unmentioned, we lift them up before you, Lord. So Lord, we thank you again for this time that we're able to gather together. May your word be opened that our hearts may receive it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys, today we're finally going to wrap up 1 Kings, which only took us 10 years. <laughs> and the cool thing about it is next week we'll go right into 2 Kings. We'll take us another 10 years. Uh, but this morning's Bible study is, is a little different because what the writer is going to do is he's now closing the chapter on 1 Kings and then introducing us into the wickedness that continues in the 2 Kings. But what the writer does is here, he takes a little bit of time to reflect on the king of Jehoshaphat. Now, we really didn't hear too much about Jehoshaphat, who is the king of Judah, after he made the alliance with King Ahab to go attack Ramoth Gilead. We know that Ahab was killed in battle, right? We talked about that last week, where Ahab just tried to disguise himself because as a man who has a wicked heart, we always try to pull a fast one on the Lord. Sometimes we think that we can do things at night because the Lord's not going to see. We know that's not true, right? The Lord sees everything. Sometimes we think we can disguise our hearts before the Lord. But we know that the Lord sees right through us. We see this is in Samuel where, uh, where David was appointed king by Nathan. right? Jesse, the father, showcased all his brothers. They looked better. They were handsome. But when he saw David, what the Bible describes as ruddy, God said to Nathan, don't look at the appearance, look at the heart. And I think a lot of times, men, that we can also try to disguise some of the things that we're going through. I mean, I can only speak for myself. There were times where I was disguising my heart before men. And I would come to church even, and, and I would speak to Christianese, and I would walk the walk and but when it came down to, or I would talk the talk, but when it came to walk in the walk, my heart was far from serving God. And we saw last week how Ahab disguised himself as a soldier to go into battle. And he told Jehoshaphat, king of the, king of the south, king of Judah, said, why don't you dress in the, kings of a, the robe of a king? And Jehoshaphat's like, okay. I mean, the enemy is going to see who he is and go right after the king, right? And Ahab thinks he succeeded in his plan to scheme and disguise himself 
because he didn't want to face the judgment that was spoken against him. And he disguises himself and he goes into battle and the, the, the men of Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, they surround Jehoshaphat because he's wearing a king's robe and then he cries out, it's me, Jehoshaphat, and the, and the 32 special forces guys surround Jehoshaphat thinking that it was Ahab. They're going to kill him and they find out that it isn't Ahab and they turn themselves aside and they go after looking for Ahab, a man who disguised himself. Ahab initially thought this plan's working. They're going after Jehoshaphat and now I'm going to go and I'm going to get away. But the Bible tells us that we looked at last week that it says a certain man, the man's not named, it says that he randomly drew his bow and shot it. And it struck Ahab between the joints of his armor. What's interesting, some commentators believe that between the breastplate and his growing area, that there was a scap in between the two where the arrow struck him. Some commentators point out that it was the gap between his arms and the breastplate that it struck him there. Regardless of where it struck him, it only took one arrow. And I was saying to us men is that we must always examine the armor of God that we've been instructed to put on. We're to always examine the areas that may be weakened. A lot of times we've allowed certain things to come in our lives that we start adjusting the breastplate of righteousness a little bit. We start adjusting it here and we adjust it there. And the next thing you know, we have exposed pieces of body that the, arm, the enemy's looking to exploit. Or we start to shuffle the helmet of salvation a little bit. We start to move it here with our own ideas and our own thoughts and our own ways of doing things. When, when Paul tells us to put on the armor of God, why? Where does our battles begin, men? It begins in our minds. And what happens is that when we allow different things to come in the way of God's word in our lives, we start to adjust the armor a little bit here, a little bit there. Next thing we know that we have sheathed our sword and we're no longer effective for the kingdom because we begin to follow our own heart. And the next thing you know that we have exposed armor or weakened armor that we're trying to walk this walk with. And what happens is the Bible tells us that the enemy walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Because men, what does he want to do with us? He wants to destroy, discourage us, destroy us and disqualify us. We all have a high priority target on our backs. And if we're not careful on examining the armor that God has instructed us to put on that belongs to him, but we begin to ne neglect it, the enemy will find a weakness. Lust may weaken our armor. Lies. Pursuits of money. Pursuits of recognition. Pride. All these things will weaken our armor. And if we're not mindful, the enemy will expose it. And how many arrows did it take to kill Ahab? One. Ephesians is clear, telling us that we're to put on this armor because we're to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. Just this morning, men, think about the battle that's gone on in our minds. Every single moment of the day, the enemy is trying to expose our armor. Are we prayed up? And, are we prayed up? Are we in God's word? Are we in fellowship? Or are we faking the funk? Coming to church, doing the things of a Christian, playing Christian, but yet our hearts are far from the truth. Because men, if we're doing that, you will get struck. And what's interesting about this arrow that struck Ahab, it said that blood ran. That means it was a profuse running of the blood. They go back and they clean off the armor of Ahab. They, he's dead. And the dogs come and lick the blood, just as, it, as said in God's word. And now as we're ending this chapter, we see that we've been looking since chapter 15. We've been looking at the north. We've been looking at a chronological event of the wicked kings of the north. And now... The writer is going to give us a little bit of fresh air and take a quick look at Jehoshaphat. But whatever happened to Jehoshaphat after he'd been suckered into doing the plan of Ahab, whatever happened to him? 
I'm glad you guys asked because we'll look at that here in a little bit. But I want to open with verse 41 of chapter 22. Read to verse 44. And again, I just want to touch on some of the things here. And then, because it's going to really lead us into 2 Kings chapter 1. But looking at verse 41 of 1 Kings chapter 22, starting with verse 41, it says, Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, had become king over Judah in the fourth year of, king, of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he became king, and he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Azuba the daughter of Selehi, and he walked in all the ways of his father Asa. He did not turn aside from doing, turn aside from them, doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. And also Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. So as we reflect back a little bit on overviewing the whole book of 1 Kings, it's taken place over about a hundred years, and it talks about the ups and downs that we've experienced. I mean, we think about the glory of Solomon. But before Solomon became king back in, in chapter 2 of 1 Kings, we saw that his brother Adonijah wanted to come and be king. He made himself king, and that was pretty much the first crisis that Solomon faced as the new king of the undivided nation of Israel. At that time, the north and the south were not divided, and First Kings has taken us from that time of Solomon's great kingdom to the dreadful years of the wickedness of Ahab. And as I shared last week, men, it's not how we start the fight, it's how we finish. This is why Hebrews talks about running this race with endurance because our Christian walkman isn't a sprint to the finish line. Because if we try to sprint through this Christian walk as a Christian, we will lose out. So many times I've seen, even myself, you guys, where I started this race quickly. And the next thing I've known, I'm falling by the wayside. This, this walk that God has called us to do, a walk of holiness set apart as men of God, is an endurance journey. We're to endure this. And we see here how the great years of Solomon started off a promising continuation of David's dynasty to end in wickedness that we see here in chapter 22. I mean, it's not how we start, it's how we finish. And we see that Solomon's kingdom gave us a glimpse of the glory of the kingdom of God. But we see Ahab's reign at the end here, a breakaway of the kingdom that God wanted to establish. It was a failure of, an, of a kingdom in an unworthy man. I started thinking about this in my own life, you guys. How many times that God has poured his spirit into my life or that my my body, my life is a temple of God and how so many times that God has entrusted me with this kingdom to further his kingdom in my heart. God says, in, the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes that God has put, put eternity in our hearts. How many times has it been in unworthy hands in my life? How many times? How many times did I make God's kingdom look bad? because of the wickedness and the unworthiness in my, in my life. So we've seen that there was a, the power that was behind Solomon and then the wickedness that took place here in the end of 1 Kings. And so what happened to this beautiful kingdom that Solomon, that the Lord even put his name on this kingdom? Well, let's look at the disasters of Ahab's reign. When you look at chapter 16, verse 33, we see this. And Ahab made a wooden image. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In chapter 18, verse 18, he says, And he answered, Have I not troubled, I have not troubled uh, Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. 
In chapter 20, verse 42, then he said to him, thus says the Lord, because you have let, let slip out of your hand a man whom I've appointed to utter destruction in reference to Ben-Hadad, therefore your life shall go for his life and your people for his people. And now as we reach the end of 1 Kings, the obvious question is, what hope can there be for the nation of Israel? We even see here when it said in uh, regarding uh, regarding Jehoshaphat, it said, nevertheless, the high places were not taken away in verse 43, for the people offered sacrifices. These are the same people here that we see in chapter 20, verse 42, where it says that the people will be appointed to utter destruction, why they followed their king. Again, the importance, men, of the example that we're leading to those around us. See, Ahab was wicked and the people followed him. And I started thinking, well, you know, it's easy to look at here and say, yeah, Ahab, you were a wicked king. But what, what, what way am I leading my wife and my kids? <coughs> I was joking with my wife the other day and, and we have a dog named Speckles and she's a mutt, a small dog. She's part Chihuahua, so she has that nasty yelp. I mean, sometimes I just want to backhand her, right? <laughs> But every time I come home or I walk to the mailbox or I walk somewhere, the dog, I mean, the dog's excited to see me. Always jumping on its hind legs. And I told my wife, you know what? You can learn from Speckles. I know she's not watching, so I can be brave, right? I see, see how Speckles jumps up and down and is like, I said, you can learn from him, from her. And I didn't go over well, wow, right? I slept on the couch that night, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was thinking about, uh, and I was joking with her, you know, look at the example. But what example are we giving to our family, men? Because here we see that the people will follow a leader even when he's wicked. So are we, sitting, are, are we living lives that are set apart for the Lord? Are we living lives that are in holiness that God's called us to do because people are following us? How are we leading our wives if our wife was to stand before the Lord and the Lord says, you look a little spiritual sucked up, guess whose fault that is? Yes, they have their own salvation they need to work out, but it's our responsibility to wash our wives with the water of the word for you married men. For those who aren't married, what about our friends? What about the influence that we have on others? What about at our jobs? Are we setting the example? Are we setting the example that they're godly, you know, one of the things that I've often heard is that if we ever, each and every one of us was in the court of law, couldn't we can be convicted by the evidence of our lives to be a follower of Christ? Or do we look so much like the world that there's no conviction or no difference that can be told? Because I lived that way, you guys, for so many years. For so many years. Friday nights, I was doing my own thing. Saturday mornings, Saturdays, I was recovering. And Sundays, I would walk to church and say, God bless you. And my heart was furthest from the truth. So what examples are we setting? And now we're taking a look back at Jehoshaphat's reign in Judah. And we're looking back a little bit here because from chapter 15 up to this point, we have not even concentrated in the south in Judah. Remember with me that there was a division. Rehoboam was going to be king of the south, Jerusalem, Judah. And Jeroboam was going to be given ten tribes. Jeroboam began to institute idol worshiping. When the Lord said to him, if you follow my ways, if you walk in my statutes, my name will be upon your kingdom. And Jeroboam began to say in his heart, that's where he... That's where he messed up. He began to say in his heart, if they go back to Judah and worship, they're going to come back and kill me. That, God didn't tell him that. God said, if you follow my ways and keep my commandments and follow my statutes, my name will be established forever. But he began, he began to listen to his heart. That's where we fail, men. We begin to listen to our hearts because we're not in God's word. And what happened from there? There was a split. And there was war between them. So since chapter 15, we haven't heard of too much what was going on in Judah. 
All we've seen since there is the wicked kings that have come forth. All we've heard about in the southern kingdom up to the chapter 15 is the ongoing war with the north and the south. That's all we've heard. And we see that here that King Ahab, the king of the north, reigned in Samaria for 22 years. And that's what we've been looking at for the last six chapters of 1 Kings. So now we come to the end of our book and our writer wants to take us back to get a snapshot of what was going on during Ahab's reign of the north, but wants to give us a glimpse of what's going to happen or what's going on in the south with Judah before we move into 2 Kings. What the writer is really doing is setting us up for the first verse of 2 Kings chapter 1. Because the 2 Kings chapter 1, the first thing you're going to see is Moab rebelled against Israel. That's what the writer wants to set us up towards. So he's ending the book with a kind of a high note, and then it's going to go into a low note, which is even going to a lower note when we get to 2 Kings chapter 1. Because from there, we're going to see nothing but destruction. Why? Because Ahab followed in the ways of his father, which go all the way back to Jeroboam, who introduced idol worship. And so when we look at verse 41... It gives us, it says, Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, had become king over Judah in the fourth year of, the, of, of Ahab's king of Israel. So we're told that he, uh, we're told about Jehoshaphat coming to the throne following of his death of Asa. Asa spoken about in chapter 15, verse 24, but we haven't heard anything since then until he meets with Ahab in chapter 22, verse 2. Remember with me that Ahab says, hey, Jehoshaphat, I need to go take Ramoth Gilead. Syria has it. I need to get it. Will you come with me? And Jehoshaphat says, sure, I'll be right there. And they get together and they form this coalition. Well, there's going to be another very similar coalition <coughs> coming up in chapter 3 of 2 Kings where Jehoshaphat's going to team up with the king of Israel again but it's going to have a different outcome. But we see here that when we look at verse 42, there's a word mentioned there, a name that we haven't heard for a little while, and it's Jerusalem. When you look at chapter, in verse 42, it talks about that, how old, that, that Jehoshaphat was 35 years old when he reigned, but he reigned 25 years in Jerusalem. Now that's a word that we haven't heard for a while because the attention has been focused on the northern kingdom. And it talks about, for us readers, it's been a long time because since the focus has been on Ahab and the wickedness of the north, we see that the writer specifically build a contrast between the two because everything that Jerusalem represented it was cut off. The worship of the true God was cut off and idol worshiping was introduced. So the word Jerusalem was not even mentioned since 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 10. Why? Because the wickedness that was going on in the north had literally cut off everything and all the significance of what Jerusalem represented. The worship of God. The place of the temple. And from there, all these uh, false worships were set up in the north in Dan and in the south in Bethel, closer to Jerusalem. And these were places where idol worshiping was introduced by Jeroboam. So since then, Jerusalem hasn't even been mentioned, which is an interesting thing because the nation of Israel centers around Jerusalem, but we haven't even heard of Jerusalem since chapter 15. Why? Because it goes back to Jeroboam's sin. Look what it reminds me. Let uh, me take you back to chapter 12, verse 28 to 30, regarding Jeroboam. It says, Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, Is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Here are your gods, O Israel, which you brought up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel and the other in Dan. Now the sin became a sin for the people went to worship before as far as Dan. So we see, I mean, how many, I know there was, Marco was there, uh, Bobby was there. Who else was in Israel this last time? Carlton, that's right, Eddie, Dave. We went to Dan and we saw the place of Jeroboam's altar where it's still intact. 
where he set up this worship. And we see that all the kings of the north began to follow suit. And the absence of any image of Jerusalem is no, no accident because it's a reflection of Israel. Jerusalem had been forgotten and the northern kingdom had put everything aside that Jerusalem represented. But our writers will not allow our writer will not allow us as readers to forget Jerusalem because before this book ends, we will return to Jerusalem. So, in verse 42, we get a chronological event of, or a little bit of historical event of Jer Jehoshaphat's family because it tells us in verse 42 that his mom's name was Azuba. Now, we don't know anything else about her, uh, but this mentioning of the mom reminds us that early on that Bathsheba was seated next to Solomon's right hand, that the moms were always listed as a place of honor in the south. And so it's interesting how the writer will point out that that kind of thing is still happening in the south where the mom is, is mentioned. We never hear of Ahab's mom, but we see that the ongoing I don't want to say tradition, but the ongoing thing to mention the mom is going on here. Remember with me that uh, Rehoboam's mother, Naama, was an Ammonite. Abijam's mother was Ma'aka. She had been disposed from, the, uh, from uh, the position of queen mother. But we see here that they have been listing mothers regarding the kings since, in, since they've been in the south. But when you walk, look at verse 43, we see something interesting here, that Jehoshaphat walked in all the ways of his father Asa. Now, in order to understand who Asa is, when you go all the way back to chapter 15, and you look at verses 9 through 24, pretty much what it says is that Asa did right in the eyes of the Lord. So he was a good king. The only thing that Asa was... was critical was criticized for is that he did not remove the high places in 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 uh, in Judah and we see the same thing here with Jehoshaphat Jehoshaphat is credited with being a righteous king doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord but his failure to close down the high places is mentioned specifically and is also the other downfall is that he made peace with Ahab and we're going to take a look at that a little bit in more detail. But the two biggest things in life, men, that we can get caught up in as men that can really hinder our walk is when we allow high places in our hearts to be raised up, to be built, and making peace with the enemy. Those are the two things, men, that will destroy our walks with the Lord. Because what happens is when we begin to set these high places of worship in our lives, we begin to worship them. We take the things that belong to God and we put these things in our hearts and we begin to worship it. We talked a little bit about that. It can be a lot of different things. It can be position. It can be pursuits. It can be a lot of different things. But what happens is that we begin to put these high places in our, in our lives and we begin to worship them. And a little by little, we start removing the things of God in our heart. And what does that lead to? It leads to pelling around with the enemy. And these are the things that are the most destructive in a man's walk, is that we allow these high places to be formed in our lives. Pride, money, recognition, women, the vida loca, whatever you guys want it to be, whatever we have lifted up to take the place of God, what it leads to is that we begin to pell around and become friends with the enemy. Men, we have to be careful with those things because it can be pleasing for a season. It may work for a while. I remember men, I mean, even in my own life, and I'm just referencing my own life. I remember that when, when I thought things were going well in my life and I felt that I was doing things of the Lord, I began to get a little lax in my heart. 
I begin to say, well, you know, I deserve this and I can get away with that and I can do a little bit of this and I can do a little bit of that. And the next thing I know is that these things, these little things became high places in my heart and my mind and my heart and my life was driven to those things. And the next thing I know, I'm palling around with the enemy. And it left my life to destruction, men, utter destruction because I've allowed these high places in my heart to take the place of God. And eventually, when my eyes should not ever adjust to darkness, it did. If we turn all the lights off in this room, you guys, all the lights, and painted the walls black and walked in here, it just takes a matter of time as we're walking in darkness for our eyes to adjust and we begin to see. See, the first time, we may be convicted. The second time, the conviction's there, but it's a little lighter. The third time, there's no conviction at all. Now the fourth time, we're walking around in darkness because our eyes were able to adjust to the darkness. It's because we have allowed high places in our hearts. And in verse 43, it says at the second part, nevertheless. Amazing transition word there. Nevertheless. So all these things that Jehoshaphat was great and mentioned, nevertheless, right? It's almost like, but. When everybody says, but to you, I call it the butt bomb. Anybody ever says, but to you, just forget everything they said before that. I love you, but, okay, now the true feelings are gonna come out, right? You're a good friend of mine, but, same thing with nevertheless. Everything that Jehoshaphat, and he did great things, Yet this one thing's pointed out, that he didn't remove the high places. Look what it says here at the end of verse 43. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. For who? Can you tell me for who? For, for the people. Remember, these are the people that were following, that got word of what was going on in the north. For the people offered sacrifices and burnt incense on the high places. Men, again, the importance of our example. People will follow you. What example are we leading? And so it says that according to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 16, it, it tells us that Jehoshaphat did remove the high places. But when you look at uh, chapter 22 of verse 43, it tells us here that they were not taken away. And then when you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 33, it indicates again that these high places were not removed. Why? If you've done so well, Jehoshaphat, if you're so well spoken of, why would you not take away the obvious? We'd have to ask ourselves the same thing, men. The obvious things in our lives that we're to remove, we don't. But it's obvious in somebody else's life. Well, when you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 17 to chapter 20, you will see that the high places were removed. Commentators are differing on this idea here that some say that, no, he didn't remove them. And some say, yes, he did remove them, but the high places that he's speaking of are the high places of worship for the Lord. So there's a little bit of divide on what commentators are saying about this. But the question is, men, is are we removing the high places that are in our hearts? You know, for a long time, I didn't even realize what were high places in my heart. You know what the biggest high place in my heart was or is and that I still battle with today is me. Think about it, men. If, there's a, if we take a group picture of all of us here, who's the first person you're going to look for? You. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that, which I highly doubt. You're going to look for you. That is a high, and not saying looking for yourself in a picture is a high place, but me, 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 me is a high place because it comes all about me. And we have, can have a tendency to muscle, try to muscle God out because it's about me. I'm going to get mine. I deserve this. I, I, I. That is a high place. And we have to remove these things from our hearts. Selfishness. I mean, I realized when I got married how selfish I really am. And my wife too. She's not watching this, so I can, I'm brave right now, you guys. <laughs> Selfishness. That's a high place. Lust. Addictions. 
Those all come from a place of selfishness. Why? I'm going to pursue it because it makes me feel good. But yet we mask it. Oh, I'm going through difficult times. And so I'm going to do this and I'm going to, no, 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 no. It's not that. It's because there's a high place in our hearts. And if we don't take them down, it will destroy us. And as mentioned before, when we look at verse 44, it says the other thing that Jehoshaphat can be checked marked for, it says that he made peace with the king of Israel. This was a treaty that we will look at in 2 Kings 11 where Jehoshaphat's son married Ahab's daughter. So that's where that connection was when they got together and fight. But we don't hear again, men, how things went for Jehoshaphat when he returned from battle. Remember with me, you guys, he went to battle, right? He went to battle with, with, uh, with Ahab. And they're going to go fight this king of Syria. Even the prophet, he was the king that said, isn't there a man of God for us to check into because these prophets that Ahab called up telling us to go into war, they're false. They're false prophets. There has to be a man of God around here. So he says, okay, there is one, but he hates me, Ahab says. So he says, shall we go up and fight? And ultimately, the, the, this prophet of God named Micaiah tells him that, I've seen a vision and God is going to put a lying spirit in your mouth to persuade you. So they go out to battle. Ahab is killed. Well, what happened to Jehoshaphat? Well, I want to turn to 2 Chronicles 19 really quick, man. And I want to read to you what happened to him as he came back. You guys don't have to turn there, but if you want to. 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verses 1 through 4. And listen. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem. This is following the battle. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, should you help the wicked one and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you and that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek the Lord. So Jehoshaphat dwelt in Jerusalem and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the mountains of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord God of their fathers. So you see that he was dealt with for even teaming up with Ahab. And we'll see this later on. But when we look at uh, uh, verse 45, when it says, now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and the might that he showed and how he made war, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles and the king of Judah? All that is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 17 to chapter 20. It gives an account of Jehoshaphat. And so when we look at verse 46, now it's going to, uh, now it's going to start referencing going back to, to uh, Azahiah, which is what we'll see here in this moment. But we'll see here, and the rest of the perverted, in verse 46, persons who remained in the days of his father Asa, he banished from the land. In verse 47, there was no king in Edom, only a deputy of the king. Verse 48, Jehoshaphat made merchant ships to go to Ophir for gold, but they never sailed, for the ships were wrecked at Izion Geber. Then Azahiah, the son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, let my servants go with your servants in the ships. But Jehoshaphat would not, duh, right? Would you ever do anything with the, the king of Israel anymore? And so Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David and his, fa uh, and his father. Then Jeho uh, Jeroboam reigned in his place. So we see that in verse 46, 46, it talks about perverted persons. So at the time when Jeroboam instituted idolatry, uh, the storm god Baal and the goddess Ashtoreth were also sex gods. And when, Jehosh, when uh, Jeroboam started introducing these idol worship, we see that one of the mothers that is mentioned in the northern kingdom made perverted wooden images. So they would institute these male prostitutes that would go into the temple and perform sodomy as their sacrifice to their God. This is what the word perverted here in verse 46 means, is that the rest of the perverted persons who remained in the days of his father Asa, he banished from the land. 
And so they have been practicing this type of worship since Rehoboam in chapter 14, verse 24. Asa got rid of them in chapter 15, but apparently not completely or not permanently. And now Jehoshaphat brings this reform to completion that was no small achievement. So yet, even though he didn't strike the high places down, he banished the, the people that were perverted. And so my question is, what does perversion mean? I mean, we think of perversion, right? And why our minds go sexually, right? Rightfully so. But perversion here also is a way of thinking. It's a way they live their lives away from God. But it's also the practice of sodomy and orgies and all those dark things. And he banished them. The word banish is that he took them out forever. Again, man, I always try to apply it to my heart because there were things in my life, guys, I didn't want to be, and I'm going to be transparent. Man, there were things that even as I, walk, as, as I was walking with the Lord, things I did not banish from my life because I thought I was entitled to it. I thought I, after working hard, I, I can, I deserve this. And it could have, and it was a number of different things, men. And it would be like from going and, and indulging in things to then leading to this and leading to that. But, you know, I felt entitled and I didn't banish these things. And I never understood what surrendering my, surrendering my life to the Lord meant. I didn't understand what walking in holiness meant. I just thought that my walk was about me and I can do whatever I want because I was under God's grace. I never understood that I had to surrender these things because if I didn't, if I didn't pull them up and pull them out like weeds, like a weed growing in my heart, I knew that the root would grow back. And I would allow these things to be in my life. And it would always rear its ugly head when I went through crisis. When I went through a difficult time, it was an excuse for me to go do that. No, it was an excuse. Yes, it was. But it's because it was seated in my heart and I did not remove it. And if we don't banish these things, men, these things that are perverted, these perverted things, they will always rear its ugly head again. We must take the time, men, to examine our hearts. Are we banishing perversion in our lives? Because, man, I can tell you this. I left a seed of perversion in my heart and that thing blew up into a forest. Be careful, men. If we are messing around with perversion, it's just a matter of time until that thing grows and grows and grows. And the next thing we know, it's out of control. We must banish those things, men. And then we see in verse 47 that there was no king in Edom. Now, this is an interesting verse. Again, what the writer's doing is he's given a little bit of a resume to Jehoshaphat. And what he's saying here that Edom, they had no king there because according, when you look at 2 Kings chapter 8, you will see that Edom was under the, was under the kingdom of, of uh, uh, I'm sorry, I got a text message, was under the kingdom of Jehoshaphat. So Jehoshaphat, in a sense, ruled over Edom. But what the writer is doing here is he points that out purposefully because it's going to come back in 2 Kings and it's going to come back because of the wickedness that was going to go on in the kingdom. And so we see in verse 48 that he made these merchant ships and, and it's, uh, he was trying to follow the ways of Solomon. And, and in verse 49, we see that Azahiah, the son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, let my servants go with you or let them go on this venture that he's saying. But when you look back at verse 48, you see that these ships were wrecked. It gives a location where they're wrecked. And the Bible isn't clear why these were wrecked. Some say it was a storm, but others say the reason that they were wrecked was because of verse 49. Because that, that Ahab or the son of Ahab wanted his servants to go with them on the ships, but Jehoshaphat said no. So there's some debate on whether how these ships were destroyed, but they were. And so the venture to go get gold and all the pursuits that Solomon had done back early on in 1 Kings was now halted. We see that Jehoshaphat now is ridding everything in the northern kingdom out of his life. And so we see that it didn't happen, that they were wrecked. 
that the shipbuilding enterprise involved a partnership with Ahab's son, but for some reason, it doesn't go through. And in verse 50, we see that Jehoshaphat dies. Now Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and were buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. It's interesting that he called him his father, which we know it wasn't his father, but it's referenced here as his father. And so he dies. And now from verse 51 to 53, it's setting us up for 2 Kings. We just looked at the great things that Jehoshaphat done. There was a couple of areas where he failed at, but overall he was a good king. And now the writer's really setting us up for 2 Kings because look what he says here in verse 51. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel and Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and Rude reigned two years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father and in the ways of his mother. Remember who his mother was, you guys? Yes. Who was it? Jezebel. Don't ever name your daughter Jezebel. His father was Ahab, his mother was Jezebel, and in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Debat. Remember Jeroboam all the way back? Imagine being always remembered as the sin of Jeroboam in the Bible. But it says, who made Israel sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger according to all that his father has done. One thing we never want to do, man, is provoke God to anger. And so we see here, men, it's not how we started. It's how we finish. Because we see here, men, the way the northern kingdom ended, it's not even going to stop there. It's going to get worse. It's not how we start, men, it's but how we finish. Are we banishing the perverted places and the high places of our, of our hearts? Because if we don't, men, it will lead to disaster. My encouragement for all of us men today is that we would be men of God's word that we be men of prayer, men who love others, men that lead by example, and men that will always examine the armor that has been given to us by God because the enemy is looking for a part where he can expose. And once he exploits it, men, he will shoot to kill. How many arrows killed Ahab? Men must be on guard. May we be men of God, Men of God's word, men who do not compromise, men who will banish the perverted things in the high places in our hearts and allow the Holy Spirit to reign, that we may walk in, uh, be men who walk in holiness, set apart, that when people see us, they see Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Next week, it gets, starts getting crazier, men. So come on back and, uh, and want to walk. Uh, thank you guys for joining us online. But let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace. Thank you for showing us, Lord, that how wickedness and perversion and high places can ultimately destroy. It destroyed a kingdom. It will definitely destroy our lives. And so we, may we be men of God's word. I thank you for the men that are here. May we walk in holiness, Lord, being filled by your spirit, living a life that glorifies you, keeping our eyes on the cross. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the men that got here and are here and the families that are represented. Thank you for the men that got here and for making the amazing steak picado burritos that came from heaven, Lord. Thank you for that. And Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen.